this is Anaihu. I am making this video to explain why I believe that the Trini that Trinitarianism is polytheistic. Now, just to let you know from the start, I am a Unitarian. However, I am not a Unitarian that, that denies the deity of the Messiah. I believe he, he is the creator. He is Yahuwah. So, I just wanted to let you know that first before we start. Now, I also have another thing to ask you all, which I will bring up later on when I read from my blog that I made. Um, the question is, if scripture told you that you had to commit adultery, and it was clear that the author of that book wanted you to commit adultery. Would you commit adultery? Or would you reject and disobey that book of scripture? I, the reason I ask is, if the scriptures actually taught the Trinity, then I argue you should reject the Trinity because the Trinity is polytheism and polytheism is evil. That's what I argue. So now I will read from my vlog my main argument. So here we go. There are several things about Trinitarianism that make it a bit complicated. Firstly, ambiguous terms are used such as the word person and proponents refrain from defining those terms. Secondly, the appeal to mystery is used to justify their belief in something that is inherently contradictory. And thirdly, it is confused by those that believe they are Trinitarians, but are actually Unitarians. From Wikipedia, we read the following. The Christian doctrine of the Trinity teaches the unity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as three persons in one Godhead. The doctrine states that God is the triune God, existing as three persons, or in the Greek, hypostasis, but one being. So, what is being claimed here by the Trinitarian? The following words shall be defined. The words I'm about to define were taken from freedictionary.com, or thefreedictionary.com, excuse me. All right. The word person. Person is defined as, I have two definitions here for you. Definition number one, the composite of characteristics that make up an individual personality or the self. So a person is the self. Definition number two, uh, a being characterized by consciousness, rationality, and a moral sense, and traditionally thought of as consisting of both a body and a mind and, its, and or soul. So a person is defined as a self and a being, according to freedictionary.com. Now, we, let's look up the definition of self. I have three definitions for you. First one, the total, essential, or particular being of a person the individual. The definition number two. The essential qualities distinguishing one person from another. Individuality. Number three. One's consciousness of one's own being or identity. The ego. Now let's define mind. With two definitions. The first one. The principle of intelligence. The spirit of consciousness regarded as an aspect of reality. Definition number two, individual consciousness, memory or recollection. Definition of being, three, three definitions, being. Definition number one, a person. Definition number two, one's basic or essential nature, personality. Definition number three, essential nature, self. Where deity, we'll define deity. Deity means a god or goddess. 
how we define God. A being, a being of supernatural powers or attributes believed in and worshipped by a people, especially a male deity thought to control some part of nature or reality. With these definitions of the words I just gave you, we can see that Trinitarianism is contradictory completely. For I ask the Trinitarian, what is the difference between three pagan deities and three persons of the Trinitarian God? How many persons are there that make up the Trinitarian God? Three. How many persons are there that make up the pagan pantheon, the triple goddess of Wicca? Three. How many selves are there that make up the Trinitarian God? Three. How many selves are there that make up the pagan pantheon, the triple goddess of Wicca? Three. How many minds are there that make up the Trinitarian God? Three. How many minds are there that make up the pagan pantheon, the triple goddess of Wicca? Three. How many individuals are there that make up the Trinitarian God? Three. How many individuals are there that make up the pagan pantheon, the triple goddess of Wicca? Three. How many personalities are there that make up the Trinitarian God? Three. How many personalities are there that make up the pagan pantheon, the triple goddess of Wicca? Three. How many deities are there that make up the Trinitarian God? Three. How many deities are there that make up the pagan pantheon, the triple goddess of Wicca? Three. You probably objected to that last one. Now, why do I say there are three, trin three deities in Trinitarianism? Because the word deity means God, and the word God means a divine being and the word being means a person or a personality or self if being is defined as person or personality or self then there are three for the trinitarian teaching is that there are three persons that make up god their god is a composite entity of three individuals that make up one collective god in the exact same way that the triple goddess of wicca is a composite entity Thus, there are three divine beings, persons, selves, minds, individuals. And if there are three beings, then there are three gods, because the definition of God is a divine being. And if there are three gods of Trinitarianism, then there are three deities. If then there are three deities that make up the god of Trinitarianism, then how can people claim that Trinitarianism is monotheistic? Monotheism, the definition, is monotheism is the belief in theology that only one deity is to be worshipped. Polytheism is the belief of multiple de deities called gods or goddesses or both that are to be worshipped, and they are usually assembled into a pantheon. Polytheism is a type of theism but contracts with, contrasts with monotheism, which is the dominant belief in the world today. In certain religions, such as Wicca, the various deities are seen as emana emanations of a greater godhead. Where have we heard that before? Thus, the collective god of Trinitarianism is the exact same as the collective pantheon of pagan religions, especially the triple goddess of Wicca, differing only in distribution of characteristics of the persons that make up the collective. I have sufficiently demonstrated logically that Trinitarianism is contradictory and impossible to hold to, for Trinitarianism claims to be monotheism, but is far from it. Obje objections to this are that people believe the scriptures teach Trinitarianism, but this is not true. While the scriptures can be interpreted to teach Trinitarianism, that is simply an interpretation. Further, that the doctrine of the Trinity does not make any sense, is contradictory, and would discredit the authority, reliability, and authenticity of the scriptures proving they did not have divine origin. Various proof texts in the scriptures are used to propagate the teaching of Trinitarianism, but the truth is, every scripture they use to teach their heresy is ripping it out of context, and it is perfectly understood, logical and consistent, uncontradictory, and makes sense with a Unitarian interpretation, which fits the context of scripture and philosophy and logic. Name any one scripture that you believe teaches Trinitarianism, and I will demonstrate that it does not teach it. One last objection is that the scriptures teach that the Son, Messiah, is Yahuwah, but the Messiah refers to the Father separate from himself. How can this be reconciled? The truth is, Yahuwah is omnipresent, so Yahuwah should have no problem to be in two separate places at once because he is in all places separate at once. Further, there are two dimensions of time, eternal and temporal. Yahuwah can be in two places at once, and he can also be in two different time dimensions at the same time. 
for Yahuwah is in all temporal times at the same time by being an eternal time, and Yahuwah is able to and does manifest himself to his creation. And this manifestation is simply Yahuwah entering temporal time while also not leaving eternal time. This is how Yahuwah is the Son and the Father separately, and yet they, they are the same person, mind, self, being, personality, individual, God, deity. So rather than three persons, one essence, I advocate three essences, aspects, roles, titles, modes. One person. My favorite analogy works perfectly. Being flawless in analogy is as follows. Just as my father is the father of myself, the son of my grandparents, and the husband of my mother, all three at the same time, and yet only one person, so also is Yahuwah, the father, the son, and the mother, or Holy Spirit. All three at the same time, and yet one person. I believe I have made it clear that Unitarianism is the only position that is able to be defined as monotheism. And that is the only one that is consistent with the scriptures and logic, and that Trinitarianism truly is polytheism. This is an Ayahu. In this video, I seek to demonstrate biblical monolatrism. I seek to demonstrate that that is true. Now, first, let me define some something for you before I start. Usually, monotheism is defined as the belief in the existence of only one God. And polytheism is defined as the belief in the existence of many gods. I find those definitions faulty, however. And I define monotheism as the worship of only one God. Whereas polytheism, I define it as worship of many gods, multiple gods. So it is with those definitions that this video is to be taken in context with my previous video on the Trinity being polytheism. Now I'm going to read from my blog about this. There we go. Monolatrism is defined as the acknowledgement of other gods actually existing, but that only one god deserves worship above all the others. Now, what is a god? Well, let's take a look at scripture. Let's read the Messiah's words. I am reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 31 to 39. Then the Jews, oh, by the way, this is from the New King James Version. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works I have shown you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said you our gods? If he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming? Because I said I am the Son of God. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and believe that the Father is in me, and I in him. Therefore, they sought again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hand. So, from this passage, we can see that he clearly calls the people who were trying to stone him gods. And he wasn't being sarcastic either. That was the crux, that was the main arguing point of the Messiah. So, now where was he quoting from? He said he was, he said is written in your law. So when we look, we find that he was quoting from the book of Psalms. So I read from Psalm chapter 82, verses 6 to 7. I said, you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. But you shall die like men, fall like one of the princes. 
So, according to scripture, humans are gods. But what is a god? I aim to define you the word god. The word god is usually defined as a worshipped being. I believe that is a false definition. When we look at scripture, we see that the Hebrew word translated as God in Psalm 82, the passage I just read, is the word Elohim. Now, what does Elohim mean? The English translations sometimes translate Elohim as the word judge. Now, even though this is usually in the minority of when they translate it, I believe this is the actual meaning of the word Elohim. So I contend that a god is simply something that is a judge. But what is a judge? It is clear from language that a judge can only be a being. A being is something that can choose. It has free will, in other words. A judge is something that can choose. But can something truly choose unless it has a soul and spirit? I thus contend that the word God does not mean something that is worshipped, but rather it means something that has a soul and spirit. So anything that has a soul and spirit is a God according to scripture and logic. This is why the Messiah told us in the Gospel of John that we are gods, because we are, since we have a soul and spirit. That is all that a God is, that which has a soul and spirit. But which, but which God with a lowercase g is God with a capital G? There is only one God that is the God, and that is our Creator, Yahuwah, the Father, Son, and Mother, or Holy Spirit, the one person. I believe I have made it clear that we are gods according to scripture, and that this is not a bad thing at all, but really good. Shalom, this is Anayahu. Uh, in this video I am responding to uh, your response. I appreciate your video response. I would like to address the scriptures that you used in support of your belief. First of all, let me ask you a question. Is the Father able to be in two places at one time? If we took 100 people and locked them each into their own room, and the rooms were spread apart by many miles, is the Father able to physically manifest himself to each of those 100 people who are separate at the same time? Or, in other words, could he manifest in 100 different places all at the same time? My answer is, yes, the Father can do that. So, there is no problem for the Father to be the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, being in three different places at one time, and yet being the same one person, rather than being three separate persons. You start off by citing Genesis 1-1 and Matthew and saying that this proves that the Spirit is not the Father. But this is not proven in the text at all. The Father and the Holy Spirit can be in two places at one time, even though the Holy Spirit is the Father. At the baptism of the Messiah, the Father, the Holy Spirit, and the Son were all present at the same time. But as I just proved above, the Father can be in three places at the same time. So I believe it is clear that scripturally, your position can't be proven that there are three persons of God. And logically, it is necessary that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are all the same person, if you're going to say that your belief system is monotheistic. And since I demonstrated that you can consistently interpret the scriptures as teaching Unitarianism, and since there is only one logical belief, Unitarianism, then it must be concluded that Unitarianism is true according to scripture, unless you believe scripture is illogical. But if scripture is illogical, then why do you believe in it? It doesn't make any sense. You read a passage in the Gospel of John where the Messiah talks to his disciples. That passage proves, excuse me, <laughs> sorry, uh, that passage proves that the Messiah is the Father. Because he says, if you know the Messiah, you know the Father. And if you see the Messiah physically, you see the Father physically. And then he responds to Philip, ask, when Philip asks him to show the Father, he responds that, don't you know me, Philip? 
when scripture says human wisdom, it is talking about wicked human wisdom. Humans that are wicked use flawed wisdom, flawed wisdom to justify their sin. As to Proverbs chapter 3 verses 5 to 7, that is a ridiculous belief you have as to your justification of being illogical. Proverbs is saying that do not lean on wicked human wisdom. In other words, any understanding that is out of a desire to be selfish, to benefit yourself, satisfy yourself in a wicked way, that is the own understanding that Proverbs is referring to. It's not saying you can't use your mind to think and be logical. I do not need to repent for using logic, and I do believe that, that the Messiah is God, Yahuwah himself, the Creator. So I do not need to repent for that either. The Messiah is also the Father, though that is where you and I disagree. If you continue to believe in polytheism, then you will be in the lake of fire. You also do not believe in works-based salvation, and therefore if you do not repent of that, you will be in the lake of fire. I say this also because I care about you and want you to be saved. I believe I have demonstrated that those scriptures you used can be interpreted in a Unitarian way and that they must be interpreted in that way or else you are being illogical. Shalom and thank you for your video response. I hope you will listen to the, to the whole video. Thank you. Shalom, this is Anayahu. I'm making this video because I would like to ask you a question. I, this question is addressed to anyone that does not believe that the Son, Messiah, is the Creator, is Yahuwah. The question is, On what basis is the Messiah able to atone for us? Or in other words, why is his atonement sufficient for us? Now, I argue that a created being cannot atone for other created beings because they do not have the authority, the eternal authority, to atone for sin that has eternal effects and consequences. Only an eternal being, or in other words, only an uncreated being, can atone for created beings. If I'm wrong, then where does the atonement come from? Does it come from a righteous person living perfectly? That's it? Or does it come from a righteous person dying unfairly? Does it come from a righteous person being murdered? Um, and we see Hebrews. Hebrews says that the blood of animals could never atone for sins. But why? Why can't the blood of animals atone for sins? If all it takes for atonement is for an innocent being to die for another being, then why 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 can't the animal why wasn't one animal sufficient for all humans? Why do you believe that the Messiah why do you believe that the Messiah is not uncreated, but he is created just like animals are created, and yet he can atone for all, all people who repent, but animals can't? Why? What's the distinction? What makes the Messiah's, what, what makes the Messiah's life and the way he died different than the animals who are innocent atoning for other beings. Why, in what way does the Messiah have authority to atone if he is not the creator? That's my question for you. And I hope that you give it some thought and uh, you probably have never heard this objection before because you are all too busy thinking about 
what do the scriptures teach? And if the scriptures don't teach something or don't explicitly say something, then you just use that to justify your belief. But we have to, it can't just be scripture. It has to also be philosophically consistent. It has to be logical. So we have to think about this. And so I, I this is why I ask this question. I want you to think about this philosophically, logically, and how the atonement makes sense. Does your view of the atonement make sense? Or is it illogical to conclude that a created being could atone for eternal sins? For a created being is not eternal. That's my question I pose to you, and I hope that you give it some thought and that you... Uh, I'm looking forward to the responses I get from people who are... who, who reject the deity of Messiah who reject that he is Yahuwah, that is. And so, yeah, I'm looking forward to what your perspective is and how you reconcile the atonement with logic and philosophy. And that's that's the question for today. Shalom. Shalom. This is Anayahu. Uh, first off, I'd just like to say that uh, I am a Unitarian that believes that Jesus, the Son, the Messiah, is Yahuwah. He's the Father. Uh, I believe in that Yahuwah is one person, not three persons. So that sets me apart from normal Christians that you would talk to. So anyway, now I'd like to address the point of your video. Uh, you made the claim that uh, God cannot be tempted. Now, in the scripture, it says God cannot be tempted. But what does that mean? We have to, we have to look at what the actual words mean. So, tempted. Now, in context, a word, the same word, can mean two completely different things, depending where and how it is used. So, when it says God cannot be tempted, why is it that God cannot be tempted, and how can God not be tempted? The reason I think that God, it says God cannot be tempted is because he told us that he cannot be tempted, and therefore he made a promise. And so he cannot break his promise because, well, no, he could, but... He is promising not to, so we trust that and say, he cannot be tempted. Now, the word tempted, when it says he cannot be tempted, I believe means a completion. So in other words, God could be tempted, but he could not be tempted into doing something. In other words, one definition of tempt means to present the possibility of doing a sin. The other definition of tempt means to convince the person to do that sin and the person does that sin. So he cannot be tempted in the sense that he will not he will not be persuaded to do that sin. He might be tempted to sin, but he will not be tempted into sinning. Now, as for the Son, the Messiah, who is God, the Father, they are one, he was tempted to sin, but he was not persuaded. He was tempted to sin, but he did not sin. He did not give in to that temptation, so he was not persuaded. And in that sense, he did not get tempted. But in another sense, he did get tempted. So I believe that is the answer to your to your question in this video. And I apologize for uh, when I don't have things written down. Sometimes I get a little, you know, I can't say it the right way exactly. But uh, I so I apologize for that. But anyway, that's my main argument here that I believe there is no contradiction 
and that Jesus is God, and that God can be tempted, but he also can't be tempted. But, as I said before, the key is understanding what it, the word tempted means in context. So, uh, now, obviously I did not prove with this video that he is God, or that the scriptures teach he's God. I merely proved that it's possible he could be. If with, with this one verse, this is what I proved, with this one verse, or this one thing you brought up, that God cannot be tempted, I demonstrated your argument does not prove that Jesus is not God. That's all I proved. I, I didn't prove that Jesus is God or anything like that. All I proved was that your argument is not credible. So, anyway, uh, that's that's the video, and uh, I'm looking forward to a response, a video response, or a comment response, anything, or private message, or whatever, uh, and I hope you uh, appreciate this response. Thank you, and shalom. Shalom. This is Anayahu. I am making this video because I wanted to challenge uh, the traditional view of what the atonement is. Um, I'm not going to get too much into some of the scriptures here, because you could probably have a good discussion about a lot of the different things, and I suppose I could always leave that, leave that for the comment box, or perhaps another video, or, you know, if you make a video response, then I'll just reply back. But in the meantime, I'm only going to discuss the logic here of it, so here we go. Um, Christians will generally say that in order for the, um, the the way he atoned, for, the way the Messiah atoned for us, is that he had to die on a cross. He had to die. He had to be killed by someone else in order for us to be saved or atoned for. I completely disagree. Now. Let me say why. There is nothing in scripture or anything at all, like philosophically, logical, or anything that requires for the way he died to be the way he had to die so that we could be saved. There's nothing about a cross. There's nothing inherently significant about a cross that gives us atonement. The reason it was on a cross, was because of prophecy. That's the only significance of it. Now, for the, so that's the way he died. In, in the way that he was killed. Now also, did he have to be sacrificed or, in other words, put to death by someone? I believe no. You probably objecting to this idea, but... I believe this to be the case. And why do I believe this to be, to be the case? Because I do not believe, morally speaking, that atonement would come through further sin. What I mean by that is, basically, the Christian position forces you to believe that the Messiah approves of the, that the Messiah, that Yahuwah wants evil to happen. He wants it. If he didn't want evil to happen, then he wouldn't have uh, done the atonement. He wouldn't have predestined the atonement. So, in the Christian viewpoint, atonement, he wants the atonement to happen and in that sense, he wants and approves of evil happening. But then he faults them for doing what he wanted them to do. And then, secondly, let's say, let's say this. If they did... Alright, the people... The Messiah was murdered, right? He was murdered on the cross. So, the people who put him to death... Uh, if they had a sudden change of heart at the last minute before he was sent to be physically punished, before the Messiah was sent to be physically punished, 
they suddenly had a change of heart. In the Christian viewpoint, if they did the right thing, we wouldn't be saved. If, if they didn't sin, we would all go to hell. So, basically, they're teaching that sin is a good thing, basically. That sin is a necessary part of us being saved. And that's ridiculous. That makes our Creator want, He wants sin to happen so that we can be saved. That doesn't make sense at all. He, so basically he condemns someone for doing something he wants. I, I, it just, if you start to, I might not have put this in the best words, might not have clearly uh, delivered uh, what I'm trying to express, but if you think about this, you just dwell on it a little bit, you'll realize, some, you'll start thinking, hmm, maybe he's right, because it just doesn't, mor morally speaking, it's repugnant to say that. Um, so, if everyone did the right thing, we'd all go to hell. <laughs> Don't you see the ridiculousness of that statement? So, I believe, I will offer you my perspective, just to, sh just to, because I believe in the atonement of the Messiah. So, I'm not trying to get you to stop believing in the Messiah or the atonement or, you know, the, the Bible. I'm trying to show you what the true atonement is. So, the true atonement, I believe, is that the Father, or God, has to live as a human. Now, that's, that's, that's not the whole part of it, but let me just say this. Living as a human, that's a serious degradation of what he currently, you know, what he was before, eternally. He, he is lowering him so, himself so much to such a lower level that that is the sacrifice. That's the, right there, that is enough of punishment right there. So when you see, so the Messiah comes down, he gets born. Now, let me, let me say this, if, the, you know, if all it was necessary was that he was murdered, then why, when he was a baby, did Messiah prevent the baby from being murdered by Herod when he was trying to kill all the babies? Uh, it's clearly something more significant than just his death. Because otherwise, Yahuwah wouldn't have really prevented that, that mass massacre. You know, he didn't even prevent, he didn't prevent the massacre from happening. All he prevented was that, that one baby not to be killed. So, it's got to be something more than just death, physical death of the Messiah. It has to be something more. And so I believe that, that in order for the atonement to put, be put into place, he has to live a righteous life as a human being. The sacrifice is that he has to be a human being and be righteous. That's the sacrifice. No further sin is committed for him to do that. There was sin committed so that he had to do that, but no sin is committed while him living his life and having to suffer that. Um, so, so I believe that it's logically consistent and morally good for this kind of atonement, because no further sin is being required for atonement to be had, and um, it just makes, it makes things make sense. Uh, so, the Messiah, actually I'm going to address some, some of the scriptures a little bit. Uh, for instance, when the Messiah was praying, he was praying, please let this cup pass from me, but your will, not my will. Now why would he pray that? The reason he was praying is that was because he didn't want to die. And he knew that 
atonement wasn't necessary for... He, he knew that him being murdered was not necessary for atonement. So he was praying, may I not die. But just as everyone else, their time comes and there was a reason and purpose for everything. For his, the way he died, it was prophetic significance in the way he died. Not the necessity of him having to be murdered and betrayed by, by, by Judas and to be put on the cross. That, well, those things weren't inherently necessary, but they were necessary for prophetic significance. He prayed that he didn't have to do those things because he knew that those weren't necessary for atonement. And he also, he prayed that because, and then the reason the Messiah planned all that, so it was so, for us to be convinced by prophecy, and he also planned that so that um, the reason here is the Messiah has to be perfectly human. So he has to be physically a human, and he has to be psychologically a human as well. So he can't have all this, you know, as as the uh, as the eternal father he he has all this knowledge and everything omniscience okay unlimited knowledge he can't have all that knowledge there and be a human so he limits himself as the scripture says he limited himself so that he could be a human in every kind of sense F physically speaking he was a human psychologically speaking he was a human so in that sense the uh, the son is uh, atoned for us, I I believe, and um, so I kind of lost my train of thought. Um, oh, hold on, <laughs> uh, anyway. Uh, so that's what I believe about the atonement, and um, I didn't have any of this written down, so I'm kind of a little. Frustrated that I don't remember what I was talking about. <laughs> but, um... So, oh yes, okay. So, the, the, you know, the, the praying, right? Um, and, uh... Okay, so he did not have to... Um, in order to be a human, he has to limit himself. He can't just disappear, right? He can't just fly away, all right? He has to depend on the Father, just like we have to depend on the Father, in order for him to be an authentic human. And remember, being an authentic human and living righteously is a requirement for our atonement. So, that's why he was praying. He was praying, please, let me escape this. But there was no way for him to escape it. His time had come, and on the cross, if he had taken himself down from the cross, he would have st had to stop being a human. He would have had to do. He would have had to initiate a miracle on his own, with his own power. But that's not how humans are, are made. Humans have to depend on the power of the Father, not of ourselves. So he had to depend on his his self in heaven. He had to depend on his depend on the Father to give him power when he needed it. And when the Father didn't give him power, he was forbidden to do anything to protect himself or save himself that a normal human could not do. So that is why he had to die on a cross. That was why he had to die there. Because there was no way for him, huma uh, humanly speaking, for him to escape that. And so he had to submit to being a human. And by submitting to being a human, he had to willingly let himself die, as all hu other humans do who are would be in that exact situation. So anyway, that's what I believe uh, the atonement is. Living righteously in a human body. And then living, yeah, living righteously his entire life. That, that's basically uh, my living and then dying. And it doesn't matter how he died, if he had died on his deathbed, just, you know, at peace, then that would have been enough atonement, so long as he was righteous that entire time. So, um, 
if you disagree, tell me why. It's probably going to be something about, uh, that's not what the scriptures say, but uh, I think I, I think my position is morally and logically superior than other positions. So anyway, uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Shalom. Shalom. This is Anayahu. I'm making this video because I would like to discuss um, several theological beliefs. Uh, all having to do with the nature of the sun. Uh, it gets kind of complicated because it's a similar thing with Trinitarianism in that Trinitarians often don't define their terms. They'll use the word person, but they won't define it. And then when you show them the clear definition of person from the dictionary, they reject that definition. But it just doesn't make sense. They don't define their terms. So we have a similar, sometimes we have a similar issue here with uh, what I'm about to discuss. They don't really define the term nature. But at, at any rate, I would just like to discuss uh, some of these things. And um, uh, to start off, I'll say that I am a Maya physit. Now, Maya physitism is one of the branches of monophysitism. Monophysitism is contrary to diophysitism. I will get to those a little bit later, but let me just discuss the second branch of myophysitism. My position, I mean, of mon second branch of monophysitism. Uh, my position, as I said, is called myophysitism, whereas the second branch of monophysitism is called Eutychianism. I'm not sure if I pronounced that right, but I'm just trying to go by the letters of the English language, and so I might have murdered the pronunciation. But uh, you'll you'll see what you'll know what name I'm talking about when you look at the uh, title of it. Eutychianism. Uh, that teaching basically um, let me let me uh, open a window. To show you, uh, I'm going to read the, basically something from Eutychianism. Um, let's see here. Sorry for a moment. Uh, my apologies. Okay, so um, basically. Um, Eutychianism is named after the person Eutychius of Constantinople. He was born in 380 AD, died in 456 AD, according to Wikipedia. Um, and so basically, he taught that the human nature of Christ was overcome by the divine. Uh, or, in other words, that Christ had a human nature, but it was unlike the rest of humanity. And another good, um, another good example, uh, okay, here it says, I'm reading from Wikipedia, one formulation is that Eutychianism stressed the unity of Christ's nature to such an extent that Christ's divinity consumed his humanity as the ocean consumes a drop of vinegar. Eutychus maintain that Christ was of two natures, but not in two natures. Separate divine and human natures had united and blended in such a manner that although Jesus was humusian with the Father, he was not humusian with man. So therefore, Eutychianism denies the manhood of the Son. And as I explained in some of my other videos, that being a human being is necessary for the atonement. There has to be, uh, since humans were made in the image of God, and they are the head of all creation because they're given dominion over all creation. They're the federal. They're the federal head of creation. So, in order to atone for all of creation, he has to become a man, live a righteous life. And if he does that, then there is atonement. Um, but Eutychianism removes that. So basically, there is no, there is no life, no, 
there's no life or death at all. There's no humanity, and humanity is necessary for atonement. If it wasn't, then Yahuwah could just atone for us with a snap of the fingers, but that doesn't make sense. There's no sacrifice. There has to be a sacrifice for atonement. The whole idea of atonement is that something is given so that something is sacrificed, something is lost for one individual so that another individual can benefit. So Yutuchianism is a false teaching. Now let me just check how much time I have. Um, okay, I, I'm good. All right. Um, so that's one uh, belief uh, that is false. Now, um, so now we'll switch to uh, monophysitism versus diophysitism. Monophysitism says that there is one nature of uh, the, the sun, and diophysitism says that there are two natures of the sun. Now. Not all diophysites claim to believe what I'm about to tell you, but a good amount of them do. It's uh, one of the chief things of diophysitism. It's uh, what you call Nestorianism. Nestorianism, basically, uh, I want to get this right, so I'm going to look it up just in case, but I'm pretty sure I know what it is, but I just want to make sure. Um, oh, yes, that, I remember what it was. Okay, basically that... Um, basically that, uh, when it, when it comes down to it, what they're really saying is that the sun is two different persons, or I, I've heard it said that there are two minds, two minds, two wills, they say, of the sun, the human will and the divine will, the human mind and the divine mind. That is completely false, because how do we know this? Because first of all, that presents the idea of multiple beings being God, which is polytheism. Secondly, uh, in order for the atonement to be actual, Yahuwah himself, the divinity, has to be the one doing the atonement. It can't be just a, just the humanity aspect of it. So, uh, so the Nestorianism makes it so that the human Jesus dies, but the divine Jesus does not die. But that doesn't work, because it just, if it, all it takes is for a human to atone for us, then it wasn't necessary for him to come down and live for us, because any other man could have done that, because the, the teaching is clear that there's the human nature, and there's the divine nature. Um, and it requires both. It requires both human and divine, the mediators between man and God. How can you be a mediator between the two if you aren't both man and God? That That's what I believe uh, is necessary, so that... Um, he forms a bridge, since he is both man and God, therefore, he can reconcile them. Through the atonement, it becomes, the atonement comes from an eternal being, and the only eternal being is the one person of Yahuwah, and so he becomes a man and lives righteous and dies. He, that he wouldn't be able to do that if the human part of him was not divine. Do you see? Do you see? Do you understand this here? The human part necessarily has to be divine; otherwise, there is no atonement to be able to have be had. Because part of the atonement, as I've proven in other videos, is that the it's all about the divine. The divine has to be human. That's the whole point. That's the whole point of atonement. If the divine is not human, then there can be no atonement. Nestorianism makes human, the human part of Jesus not divine. Therefore, Nestorianism is false. And that's characteristic of diophysitism in general, but not all diophysites will, would say that. Some would say monophyletism, which is one will, two natures. I'm not exactly sure what they mean on that. It seems kind of contradictory. Uh, one, one, one will, one mind, two natures. Uh, 
it, it, you know, it can't be two natures. It has to be one nature so that, because, as I said, the divine has to be human. It you know, it can't be divine and human. It has to be divine human. Therefore, myophysitism, as what I believe, teaches that the human aspect of the, the creator is not distinct or separate in any way from the divine aspect. How does this, how we understand that? Well, you see, what makes us human? Is it, um, our, is it, is it, uh, all right, you know, you just think what, what makes us human. And I believe the answer is, well, first of all, I believe there are many souls that Yahuwah created. Now, he could have put the soul, I believe animals have souls, by the way, so, hypothetically speaking, he could have put, he put a soul in a dog, but he could have put that soul that he put in the dog, he could have put it into a human. The souls are uh, interchangeable, they can go to any created being. But, for Yahuwah, he's an uncreated being. So that's the difference between him and humanity. But, for the definition of humanity, it is not a the definition of humanity is not a created being that is human. No, it's just physically. It's what it's physically about. The physical definition of a human makes someone a human. Not the soul. What, what your soul is, it's what the physical aspect is of it. So, um, so then when you look into that further, I believe the only, the, for the Messiah, when he incarnated, became a human, he created for himself a physical body that was a human body. And he, lower, he lowered his mind so that he would have the capabilities of a human mind. He didn't, he didn't become a new mind. He kept the same mind he always had and just he, he voluntarily shut off some of his powers. He refused to use certain parts of his mind so that he could authentically be human. Because what humanity is, is, as I said, it's all about the physical part. It has to be physically human, and part of physical is psychological, because the psychological is connected intimately to the physical, as we learn from science. So, his psychological mind, his, his will, his mind, has to be limited to the capabilities and level of a regular, normal human being. His mind doesn't change, it just gets limited to from what it was. So that's how I believe he became human. He simply chose to not use certain parts of his mind, but he never lost those parts of his mind, he simply uh, took, he simply closed those parts off. So by closing those parts off of his mind, he therefore becomes an authentic human, but at the same time does not lose his divinity because he never became a different mind. He just uh, decreased the capabilities of his mind so that he could be authentically human. So that's what I believe my uh, is the truth, my physicism. It's the only belief that allows for um, the atonement to be had because atonement, as I said, and I keep saying it, uh, just to emphasize, is that divine has to be a human. And that can only be the case with Maya physicism. So at, at any rate, um, there's a lot more theological points of these things, and so I'm just sort of barely getting into it here. But uh, this is just one video to cover these specific beliefs that I mentioned, and um, I hope you appreciate uh, my explanation and why I believe that Maya physicism is correct. And uh, if you disagree, if you have a different position, tell me why, and uh, I hope you, well, you know, use scripture, that's, that's good. But I don't care if you use scripture, you can if you want to help your case, but also I want to just make sure that it's logical, otherwise it's, you know, it's not going to have any credit. It has to have credibility, and in order for it to have credibility, it has to be logically consistent. So please, whatever argument you use, make sure it's logical, and also that it does not contradict the scriptures. Thank you, and I hope you have a good day, and Shalom. Shalom, this is Anayahu. I am making this video because I would like to talk about 
the cross today. Um, okay, so there's a lot. There's a lot of interesting things about the cross. Discussing uh, it. Um, well, at first, I guess I'll start with uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, they teach this idea that the cross is pagan. So, you know, they despise the cross in all ways possible. They reject it as uh, the origins of it are pagan according to Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, now, I don't discredit a belief based on who is teaching it, who is claiming it. So I don't discredit a Jehovah's Witness belief because they're Jehovah's Witnesses, even though I think Jehovah's Witnesses are wrong on most things. Uh, just because they believe something doesn't necessarily mean they're wrong on it. Uh, I agree with several things that they believe. Uh, the um, Their view on... Uh, uh, heaven on earth, uh, you know, the, uh, and, um, their views on blood, I also agree with, so, there's several different things that we, ha I have in common with Jehovah's Witnesses, but at the same time, for the most part, there's no similarity whatsoever between me and Jehovah's Witnesses, and I only go by the logic and the scriptures, you have to go by that, so, uh, and logic and scriptures do not contradict, by the way, but at any rate, uh, I'll continue, so, uh, there is this idea that paganism is linked to the cross, and I'm, I disagree with that. That's not true. Uh, the origins of the cross, uh, well, they, they were certainly used by pagans uh, before um, the Messiah was born. It was even, uh, I think they said even in the time around Plato. So, like, we're, we're talking, you know, 500 BCs, around, you know, that that's the kind of thing we're talking about. That's how old it is. Now, um, so, uh, it definitely was used by pagans. And also, I'm going to get to it in a little bit, that uh, it has also been corrupted into uh, something it wasn't ever supposed to be. But, uh, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, okay, so... The Jehovah's Witnesses um, have an interesting claim, but there's the historical evidence is strongly against their claim. Now, there's a good claim to say that their view of what the cross was, they view it as a stake. So, in the traditional view of the cross is um, like this, right? Their view is just like this. It's not We don't have this. Their, their view is just, you know, one upright beam. That's it. Um, that was I. W I would say that that was probably how it originated way back. You know, in the 500 BCs or how whenever it was first used, way back when before the Messiah was born. But by the time, by the time of the Messiah, it transformed from this into many other different kind of shapes. There was uh, there was this. There was this. There was this. Uh, there is a whole bunch of different ones. There's this, and um, so by the time of the Messiah, we see that the cross is uh, is what pretty much what tra tradition teaches. And the reason I say this is uh, we have the earliest church fathers, Justin Martyr, Tertullian, um, all teaching that. The cross was um, typified by Moses outstretching his hands when his hands were raised uh, during that war, where whenever his hands were raised up, uh, they won, and when his hands were down, they were losing uh, the, the war. So, they they their descriptions of that type clearly point to um, this idea of the cross being more like this, not just this. Uh, also, Epistle of Barnabas, which I consider scripture, but if you even if you don't consider it scripture, it's a very early church document, very early writing. And so, um, that writing, Epistle of Barnabas, also shares that view of Justin Martyr and Irenaeus about 
the Moses outstretching his hands being a type of the cross, but it also has this to add. I'm going to read from the Epistle of Barnabas. Okay? Um, there's this thing called gematria, or along those lines, where basically every letter in an alphabet, every letter in the alphabet stands for a number. So, this is the idea here. Um, okay, so he quotes the Old Testament and he says, For it says, Abraham circumcised 18 and 300 men from his household. That was a quote from uh, the book of Genesis, okay? Uh, in chapter 14 and 17, about. So, uh, so then Barnabas says, What knowledge then was given to him? Notice the first he mentions the 18, and then, after a pause, the 300. The number 18 consists of an Yoda and an Ada. There you have Jesus. And because the cross was about to have grace in the letter Tau, he next gives the 300 Tau. And so he shows the name Jesus by the first two letters and the cross by the other. So, basically, right there. Now, I'm not exactly sure if uh, what was the original language Epistle of Barnabas was written in. I want to say it was written in Hebrew, but uh, even if it wasn't, uh, or, you know, if let's say it was written in Hebrew, but it was only talking about the, like, how do I put this? Okay. Um, currently, Hebrew gematria can't be reconciled with that, so he could have written it in Hebrew, but talking about a Greek gem gematria. But uh, at any rate, uh, it at, at least from the manuscripts we have, it's clearly talking about a Greek gematria. Um, and so how this works is Yoda, that's one of the letters of the Greek alphabet. Yoda is an I. Uh, it looks like an I in the, of the English language. Um, and a Ada is an E. Okay. So, Yoda, Ada. So, in the Greek, the name of Jesus is Iesus. The first two letters are Yoda and an Ada. Yeah. You know, it's, it's an abbreviation. Just like uh, in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament, you see the divine name, Yahuwah, Y-H-W-H. It's shortened to Yahu, just, you know, like, uh, or Yah. So, Isaiah. Or, in the Hebrew, it's Yeshayahu. That's the Hebrew name of Isaiah, Yeshayahu. And for Jeremiah, it's Yermayahu. But th that, those are abbreviations of the entire name, Yahuwah. So in this case, it's being an abbreviation to stand for Jesus, or Jesus. So, uh, at any rate, that, that, that explains that part. And then, the, the significant part here, the, the part that's... Uh, in the context of this video, is the cross. He says, Tau, Tau. Uh, I don't know how if you have, I'm pronouncing that right, but Tau, T-A-U. The Greek letter Tau is a T. It looks like this. So it is clear, Epistle of Barnabas is teaching that the cross was like this. Maybe it was like this. Maybe not. But it was at least like this. There was a beam that went across, okay? So, it's clear that the cross was not a stake, as the Jehovah's Witnesses teach. It was a Tau. Okay? So, now in the Hebrew, uh, Tav would be the equivalent. Uh, but unfortunately, the Gematria currently, from what I've studied, doesn't reconcile. <coughs> Tav is a 400. But at any rate, if somehow it were to be reconciled, maybe the Gematria that we know of today if for the Hebrew was false. It's always possible. Um, but, um, it's an X. Now, that's a cross, too. Look at that. If you just switch it, you, you see? But it's an X, like that. So, it's a cross. So, Tav, Tau. They're, they're both a cross, okay? It's clear that if it's either Hebrew or Greek, whichever one it was, it's clearly meant to be close to what the tr traditional view of the cross is, not what the Jehovah's Witnesses teach. So, the cross is not a pagan thing, okay? The cross is what he was crucified on, all right? So I, that, I believe I've proven that. Now I also want to discuss um, um, 
unfortunately, the cross has been basically worshipped. Uh, it's been put into idolatry. So, the, unfortunately, it has become part of paganism. But it doesn't have to be. It's not inherently pagan. Um, but, see, a lot of Christians believe that the cross is somehow somehow saves them. The cross saves them. They worship the cross because they give it power for atonement. They say, we could not have been atoned except through the cross. Now, that is idolatry That right there. That's idolatrous. The cross does not save us, okay? Yahushua, Yahuwah, our Father, saves us. Not a cross, okay? He did not need a cross to save us. He did not need a cross, okay? Anyone else who teaches that, they're basically worshipping a cross because they say that the cross atones for them, not the Messiah. It's the Messiah that atones, not the cross, okay, people? So, we need to stop worshipping the cross. Now, here's a prophecy I'm reading from Scripture here. The Lives of the Prophets. It's called The book of Scripture I'm reading from is called The Lives of the Prophets, okay? You probably don't consider it Scripture, but it is Scripture. At any rate, I'm reading right here um, from the life of Jeremiah, okay? Uh, Jeremiah also gave a sign to the priests of Egypt that their idols would be shaken and their gods made with hands would all collapse when there should appear in Egypt a virgin bearing a child of divine appearance. Wherefore, even to the present time they honor a virgin mother and placing a babe in a manger, they bow down to it. When Ptolemy, the king, sought the reason for this, they said to him, It is a mystery handed down from our fathers, a sign delivered to them by a holy prophet, and we are awaiting its fulfillment. This prophet, before the destruction of the temple, took possession of the ark of the law and, of, and the things within it, and caused them to be swallowed up in a rocky cliff. And he said to those who were present, The Lord departed from Sinai into heaven, and he will again come with might. And this shall be for you the sign of his appearance, when all the Gentiles worship a piece of wood. Okay? So, the lives of the prophets. Jeremiah is prophesying here that the Gentiles will worship a piece of wood. That's idolatry right there. He's prophesying of idolatry, and that's what we see today. We see Gentiles everywhere worshiping cross. Uh, and even and Catholics go even farther. They you know, hold their crosses, and you know they believe it has magical powers and things like that. So um, now let me discuss one last thing about the cross before I finish for today. There is um, from. The Acts of Thomas, uh, which I consider scripture currently, um, it says uh, in the Syriac version of the Acts of Thomas, chapter 54, And he said unto the youth, Stretch thy mind towards our Lord. And he signed him with the cross. Having signed him, go and blah, blah, blah. It continues the story. But anyway, from the Acts of Thomas, we see the sign of the cross. And the Acts of Paul and Thecla. Let's look at that. Chapter 22. Uh, now the boys and the maidens brought wood and hay to burn he Thecla. And when she was brought in naked, the governor wept and marveled at the power that was in her. And they laid the wood, and the executioner bade her mount upon the pyre. And she, making the sign of the cross, went up from the wood. Um, okay, so basically, and you also have Tertullian in 200 AD mentioning that they use the sign of the cross. So basically, uh, the early followers, the early believers, did the sign of the cross, but not for any magic or anything. It was a significance of, uh, it was symbolic. It was to honor the, honor the sacrifice that Yahushua made for us, the, the pain that Yahushua had to go through us so that he could, so that he could be a human. He had to, he had to endure the cross because he had to be a human, and so they recognized that and honored his sacrifice in that sense. And so that's pretty much all I, ha I had to say about the cross for today. For I'm going to make another video at some point about the scriptures about the cross and objections to it. But any rate, uh, shalom. This is Adiahu. Uh I'm making this video. Uh, as uh, I, 
be because I want to address some of the scriptures in uh, in the context of one of the previous videos I made on the atonement of the Messiah. Uh, there has been raised some objections as to how my view of the atonement of Yahushua, the Son and Father, can be reconciled with scripture. Okay, and that's a good question because um, unless you claim that the scriptures are evil, which I do not claim, although could, hypothetically speaking, be possible, but I do not believe that to be the case, unless you come to that conclusion, or if you come to the conclusion that scripture was corrupted, I'm, I'm not talking about either of those in the case of this, uh, then it's a good question, because we, if our views are not in sync with what scripture teaches, and scripture is not corrupted or evil, then clearly... We are wrong, and the scripture is correct, assuming, you know, the scripture has authority, right? Um, so, um, so that's why this video is for today, to address some of those uh, claims that my view does not reconcile with the rest of the things, uh, with, the, with the rest of the scriptures, okay? Um, all right, well, first of all, I'd like to read from uh, Hebrews, okay? Hebrews chapter... 9, verse 11, okay? Oh, no, I'll, I'll start with, um, um, let's start with verse 19. Go 19 to 21, okay? For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without shedding of blood there is no remission. Okay, listen here. People, you cannot use this verse to say that the Messiah had to shed blood for us to for our sins to be remitted okay for for one thing um, there's clearly the the animal sacrifices which by the way I believe are still supposed to be done uh, in their proper time and place uh, they were not abolished but anyway that's a whole nother discussion but at any rate um, the animal sacrifices the animal the Levitical priesthood is completely different from the Melchizedek priesthood the Levitical and animal sacrifices, that's an earthly priesthood. That's an earthly function, okay? Whereas, that, that's a mortal. That's that's for the mortal priesthood and mortal uh, sacrifices. But in the case of Melchizedek priesthood, that is an immortal priesthood. And the sacrifice is eternal and is not limited like the sacrifices of mortality, okay? So, of the earth, that is. Okay, so, we look at what Hebrews says, and it shows a distinction, okay? Obviously, there isn't a, a distinction, but I'm just uh, emphasizing this, because you guys seem to not, you seem to be ignore, ignoring that fact. Okay, so, um, verse 4 of chapter 10 of Hebrews, it says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. So therefore, animal sacrifices does not atone for sins, okay, people? Now, that's clearly different than the Messiah. His sacrifice atones for sins, okay? Now, when we look at the uh, chapter 9, verse 22, it says, According to law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. When it says without shedding of blood, there is no remission, it's talking about the almost part. So all the, all the things that are purified with blood, without shedding of that blood, there is no remission for those specific things. But for the things that almost doesn't include, for the exceptions, there is a remission of sins, okay? Um, and, for, and this verse is only talking about the blood of the covenant in which the animal sacrifices it's talking about. It's not talking about 
the it's not talking about uh, the Messiah's sacrifice, okay? It's talking about the animal sacrifices. Those are two completely different things. Obviously, they do not, they're not the exact same thing, because I just showed you earlier that the Messiah's sacrifice actually atones, and the animals don't. So there is a distinction. So, this is clearly talking about animal sacrifices, but not all animal sacrifices, because as it says right here, according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. Alright? Um... And, okay, so, um, basically, um, now what, what else do I want to say, um, okay. So, yeah, so I, I just think that, uh, that right there demonstrates that the Messiah, uh, it, it's a different, completely different, you can't use that verse to say that the Messiah had to have his blood shed. There's also a difference because, he, um, it is not a sin to use another creature for food that is not from your kind that is healthy for you to use. What I mean by that is, I believe it is a sin for cannibalism. For every species, it's cannibalism is a sin, okay? Um, and so, for humans, we're not allowed to, to do stuff to humans that we can do to other people, to other creatures. We can eat other... Part of the animal sacrifices in the Law of Moses, they almost... All, the priests almost always ate the food that they sacrificed, okay? So it was like a regular meal they were basically having, except they dedicated it to Yahuwah as a, an atonement, okay? So... Um, so for... But it's different with the Messiah, because he's a man, he's a human. And the Law of Moses clearly says human sacrifice is a sin. So, Yahuwah would not actively try to, you know, if he, if he had his way, he would have made it so that um, Yahushua did not have to be sacrificed. It wasn't inherent that he had to be sacrificed, okay? It wasn't inherent that he had to be killed by other humans. That's, that's a sin right there. The sacrifice of, G of Yahushua, Jesus, that was a sin. When you sacrifice the animals, that's not a sin. It's not a sin to kill animals and use them in a righteous way. It's a sin to kill your own kind, okay? It's a very similar principle to the idea of relations, uh, sex, okay? Um, sex within your kind is righteous. But once you go past that boundary, once you start having relations with animals, or when angels start having relations with humans, that crosses the lines, and that is perversion. And that, so you see, it's all—it's about kinds here. There's, there's an, this idea of uh, respecting the kinds. Okay, you respect your own kind by doing those things. All right, you are allowed to eat other kinds because they're not your kind. You cannot eat your own kind because. It's disrespectful to your kind. That's the shortened version of it, anyway. Okay, so um, so it's clear that you can't compare the two morally speaking. Animal sacrifices are amoral, whereas human sacrifice is immoral. Okay, that that's the that's the uh, what the scriptures teach. So, um, so in in the sense human sacrifice in the sense of um, murdering. Okay, or killing for atonement. Um, and I've said it always in all my other videos, Messiah's, the atonement of the Messiah did not come through him being killed, it came through him living a righteous life. Okay, so that was a sacrifice, a human sacrifice, but not in the traditional sense of the phrase human sacrifice. At any rate, now let me address um, another scripture, okay? Um, how am I doing on time? Okay, I'm pretty good. All right. Uh, Isaiah chapter 53. This is one used, okay? Um, okay, so it says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet he, we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our, for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. People use this to justify their belief, saying that if Messiah wasn't whipped 
we wouldn't be healed. If Messiah wasn't bruised, we wouldn't, we wouldn't, uh, our iniquities wouldn't be done away with. Uh, and if he wasn't wounded, our transgressions would remain and be held against us. That's ridiculous, okay? What the passage is saying, Isaiah chapter 53, that is, what he is saying, as I've said before, the Messiah has to be a human for the atonement to be actual. He has to be a divine human, okay? He has to be a righteous human. But in order to be a righteous human, he can't initiate miracles on his own power. He has to depend on his Father in who is in the eternal time, okay? He cannot depend on himself. He has to depend on the Father in eternity. So, with that being said, he suffered those things so that he could remain a human so that he could atone for us. Him remaining a human and being righteous atones for us. Not his being wounded and beaten up. While he was being beaten up, he had to willingly submit to the being beaten up, because if he didn't submit to the being beaten up, then he would have had to stop being a human, and therefore the atonement would be void. So the idea is, he was wounded for our transgressions, because he had to remain a human, so he, had, so he was wounded for our transgressions, uh, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. For if he didn't submit to the stripes being inflicted upon him, he would have had to stop being a human, and we wouldn't have been saved, because he would have stopped being a human. So the whole idea here is that he remained a human. He submitted to being a human, and by submitting, by submitting to being a human, he allowed himself willingly to be wounded and in that sense he was wounded for our transgressions bruised for our iniquities the chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed and um one more thing you'll see in scripture throughout even in ignatius you'll see in ignatius's writings scripture that uh and in paul's writings you see and peter's you see uh justified through his blood or by his blood okay now, it does not say anything about his the shedding of his blood, okay? It says, by his blood. Now, in Leviticus, we read that the life is in the blood, okay? So we are saved by his life. That's what it's saying. We're saved by his blood, through his blood. His, his blood is life, okay? We're saved through his humanity, his righteous humanity. He's submitting to being a righteous human and living his life in righteousness as a human. And that is what is talking about blood. Because as I said, Leviticus clearly says, just read it, Leviticus chapter 17, I believe it is. Uh, the life is in the blood. Okay? Blood is life. Therefore, he, we are saved through his life. Not the shedding of his blood. There's nothing about the shedding. It does not mention shedding in any scripture that we are saved through. We are saved by his life or his blood. Okay? So that's how I understand those verses. There's probably more verses in scripture that I've missed or haven't discussed. Because we know there's a lot of books of scripture. Uh, especially more than the 66. But even if you just have the 66, there's a lot to deal with. So at any rate... I believe I have sufficiently demonstrated uh, my beliefs in regards to those three passages of scripture, and I believe I have defended adequately my position that uh, the scriptures, though at least those scriptures that I brought up, reconcile with my view of the atonement in a fair way that is not, uh, you know, ch cheating. I believe it it it, it uh, reconciles. Anyway, that's my video, and shalom. Shalom, this is Anaihu. I'm making another video on, uh, once again, it's another video of Christology. I, uh, 
I have to actually make a lot of videos on Christology, although I may be getting a little tired of that eventually, and I might take a break from that and go on to other kinds of videos and then return to Christology eventually. But for now, I have another video uh, that I'd like to share with you in regards to this to this field of Christology. And uh, it discusses uh, peccabili peccability versus impeccability. Now, what is what are those terms? Generally, they're only applied to the Son, but I'm applying them to the Son, Father, and Holy Spirit because they're all the same person. So we're going to apply them to all of them, okay? So, so let's apply to them. All right. Uh, Im impeccability means that uh, God or Jesus cannot sin. Peccability means Jesus could sin. He's able to sin. So the idea here is um, uh, it's talking about if he has the ability to sin. Does Jesus have the ability to sin or does he not have the ability to sin? And um, it would go, uh, people would argue otherwise. Uh, what am I about to say? But uh, it goes the same for the Son as it does for the Father. Okay? Well, first of all, they're the same person. And secondly, even if you had Trinitarianism, there's no, there should be no reason that the Son and the Father would have different, uh, you know, morality. Okay? They're both God, so the same conclusion should be reached now. Uh, as I, but, you know, in my other videos, I showed how Trinitarianism is false. Um, and at any rate, uh, so Jesus is God, um, but he's one person with the Father. They're the same person. They're not three different persons, okay? Um, so, peccability versus impeccability. It applies to all three persons, okay? So, anyway, I'm kind of going in circles here. I like to do that sometimes, just to emphasize uh, repeating so that I can drill it into your head. Because I figure if I say it only once briefly, it'll just go over your head. But if I say it again and again and again, at least three times, then maybe you'll understand it. Another part of it is, I'm um, sometimes I like to stall. Uh, I like to stall, so I say the same thing over and over again. But, you know, it's a combination of those two things. But anyway, so, impeccability versus peccability. Uh... I'm just going to start off right from the bat saying what my position is. It's peccability, okay? He is able to sin. God is able to sin. I do not believe that God has sinned ever or that he ever will sin. That's not the question. The question is, could he sin? Is he able to have sinned and is he able to sin throughout his throughout eternity? Is he ever able to sin? Uh, now, People are going to immediately jump out at me and use scripture and say, it says in scripture, God cannot sin. Or, in one example, God cannot lie. Okay? God cannot lie. Now, why does it say God cannot lie? What does that mean? Now, it could mean that he is incapable of lying. It's impossible for him to lie. Or, that well, it could be, but that's absurd. But the true meaning of it is, I believe, is that uh, because, well, first of all, he has revealed what's going to happen. Prophecy, okay? He's revealed all things to us. So, we can trust his prophet. We, we're assuming that we can trust the prophecy. And the prophecy says, he, basically, it's saying that he will not sin. Okay? The prophecy is, he will not sin. So, in that sense, well, since we know what will happen, he cannot do it, because we know what's going to happen. So there's no way that it's going to be otherwise. But in actual truth, he could do differently. But since we know the future, he can't do that. He, he still can do, he can choose to do otherwise than what he's going to do, but he won't do that. And since he won't do that, since, he's already, we, since we know that he's already decided to do that, he can't do otherwise. Because um, you can, for it's it's about will here, okay? When you will to do something, so long as you're willing to do that thing, you can't do otherwise than what you're willing. 
you can only do what you're currently willing to do. So, he can, he is able to will otherwise, but since he has told us that he has willed to never lie, therefore he cannot lie because that is what he has willed himself to do. And you can't do otherwise than what you're willing to do, okay? For if you did otherwise, then you'd be willing to do otherwise. So since he's willing, since he's willing to not sin, therefore he can't, uh, he can't sin, okay? So that's what I believe scripture means when it says he cannot sin, because he's willing, he's, his will is that I am choosing not to sin. And when you choose something, you can't do otherwise than what you're willing, you're choosing to do, okay? Um, and what you have decided to do, then you can't do otherwise. If I decide I'm going to punch someone in the face, okay? As I make that choice, there, I can't change that, okay? I've made that choice, that's what I'm doing. You can't do otherwise than what you've chosen. He has chosen to never do evil, therefore he can't do otherwise, okay? But he could have done otherwise, alright? And he could change his will if he, you know, if he's going through the punch, he could quickly stop or pull back, you know. But um, while he's doing that, while he's willing to do that, he can't, he can't do otherwise until he wills to do otherwise, okay? That's what it's saying. Uh, at any rate, um, so now I will continue and basically, um, um, if you believe that, all right, there's this idea, um, where does morality come from? Morality, right? Okay. Um, a lot of people think that Yahuwah, or the Creator, created morality. Now that's a repugnant belief. Uh, because it makes morality into this very arbitrary thing, okay? Um, basically, if He created morality, then He could have made it so that raping people is morally good. He could have made it so that um, universal salvation is morally good. So since he could have he could have made a whole bunch of things morally good. But now the question is if he could have made universal salvation good, why didn't he? If he creates the rules here, right? If he creates the rules, then why didn't he create it so that the best thing would happen, you know, it doesn't make sense. All the things he goes through in scripture, it just really doesn't make sense. All this thing about free will and how he's trying to get us saved, he's trying to get us to repent. Why? If he just, if he creates those rules, he's making his own problems, okay? He's, it's ridiculous. He's, uh, he's his own worst enemy, okay? He's not his own worst enemy. That's the most ridiculous idea. It's self-defeating. It, it's meaningless, okay? Uh, so it's clear that he did not create morality because it has to be that morality is eternal, okay? So this whole thing about the, you, uh, it's called the Euthyphro dilemma. Um, it's not a dilemma here, okay? It might seem like a dilemma to some people because it's like, well, I don't want to say that God arbitrarily creates morality, but I don't want to say morality exists apart from God. There's nothing wrong with morality existing apart from God, okay, people? There's nothing wrong with that. It's just your warped view of sovereignty, okay? He does not have to be... Uh, morality does not have to be part of him for him to be sovereign, okay? He can be in submission to morality, all right? Um, He's in submission to the laws of logic, truth. He didn't create truth. The truth has to exist before you can... If you were to create something, you need truth to exist, because that's logic, the rules of logic, the law of identity. That's one thing. Law of identity, law of non-contradiction. If you don't have those two laws, you can't do a creating act. You can't do anything sensible, because it wouldn't be make sense. It's, you know, sense, identity, truth, that all is explicitly, intricately linked to logic and truth. And if you don't have those things, then 
you know, it, the whole thing go, goes apart. You can't create truth if truth didn't already exist. And if truth already existed, then you wouldn't need to create truth. Therefore, we conclude that truth has always existed. The same thing with morality, people. Morality, you can't, he, it's, it makes it, it's self-defeating. If morality, if morality has a reason, if it's, uh, you know, if it's for actual good, and not just arbitrary, then it was not created. If it was created, it's arbitrary. That's the proof. That's true. And you can't you can't prove other. You can't say otherwise because any attempt to say otherwise just leads in self contradictions and illogical conclusions. Okay. So it is clear that um, that a father, a son, you know, Yahuwah, the Creator, did not what was not able. I mean, excuse me. Okay. He was able to sin. He has to be able to sin because uh, if he can't, then we're more powerful than him, okay? Um, he has, you know, all the things he does, you know, we're actually making the choices. So if we choose an angel, okay, angel has free will, right? And it, all the righteous angels that have never sinned, they actually chose of their free will to not sin. But in the case of Yahuwah, if he can't do evil, then he's not choosing at all. He's forced to do it, okay? And that's ridiculous. That puts Yahuwah's morality into question. He is not to be respected at all. You can't respect someone that's forced to do something. A computer, right? If, if you tell a computer to do something, it can't do otherwise. You don't respect a computer for, for having to do what it tells you to do. You respect something if it chooses to do when it didn't have to do, okay? That's the, where the respect comes from. So, we can all, respect is only to be given to Yahuwah if he is able to sin. And he chooses not to. That's the respect and honor that we give him. Uh, we can't, you, don't, you don't respect a being that is, is forced to do something, okay? It's ridiculous. Um, so now I also have another proof. I have one more proof for you before this. Uh, I'm getting close to the 15 minute mark here. So, okay, uh, the Messiah, the Son. Now this argument won't work for you if you reject the deity of Messiah. But for those that believe that Jesus is God, Jesus was tempted. The temptation only makes sense if you have the ability not to sin. Otherwise, it's not temptation. Okay. Uh, they're being tempted to not, they're being tempted to sin, okay? So, the whole concept of temptation is that they are, they see something desirable and it presents a possibility of sin. That's what temptation means. And if you say Yahushua or Jesus was tempted, that means God was tempted. And if God was tempted, then that means God could sin because you can't be tempted if you can't sin. Okay, people? So it's clear that if Jesus is God, then God can sin. He's able to sin because he was tempted. Therefore, that's proof right there from Scripture. And I used philosophy, I used philosophy logic, and Scripture to prove that, that God... Yahuwah, the Son, Father, Holy Spirit, one, uh, is able to sin. So, peccability. I just demonstrated peccability here, okay? Anything else is self-defeating, immoral, makes morality arbitrary, and is just ludicrous. It's ridiculous, okay? So, at any rate, uh, that's the end of my video, essentially. And um, if you have evidence to the contrary of my position, uh, I'd be happy to hear your arguments for that, your logic, your reasoning, maybe a scripture if you wanted to, but uh, whatever you think, uh, just try, uh, if you feel like it, to refute these arguments, but it's impossible to refute them because the logic is perfect. So, uh, at any rate, thank you for watching this video, and I hope you have a great day, and Shalom. Shalom, this is Anaihu. I'm making this video in response to uh, certain Unitarians that teach that 
Jesus, the Son, is not God, is not Yahuwah, not the Father. Um, so, let us uh, discuss some of the uh, arguments they use from Scripture to um, say otherwise. So, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be principally using the arguments from, uh, discussing the arguments from a YouTube channel uh, called Prove Your Faith, youtube.com slash user slash prove your faith. He does not allow for comments or video responses as far as I'm aware, so this is the best I can do for a video response. In the meantime, I'll now discuss uh, his things. Uh, he, his, one of his very first videos, uh, his older videos, I think is what it was, um, Revel he, uh, he reads the first chapter of Revelation, and um, he goes to verse 8 and demonstrates how in that passage it distinct... Um, you can't you can't prove in that passage that the Son is the one saying I am the Alpha and the Omega, which uh, I would agree with. You can't prove it, it specifically with that verse, okay? But that actually helps to prove my case. Let's 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 give him the given that Revelation chapter one is talking about um, the Father, okay? So then let's go over to Revelation chapter twenty one to twenty two. So we start off um, uh, verse two. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Now verse 5, look at this, it says, Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Um, so right there, we see that the person, he who sits on the throne says that he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, okay? Uh, and he's saying he will be our God, and we shall be his son. Now, let's go down to Revelation chapter 22, um, verse 9, okay? Starting with verse 9. Because it is clear that verse 9, it's the same one who is sitting on the throne. Because we can tell that from verse 9 all the way to verse 16. We'll see that it's the person who is sitting on the throne. The, the one who is sitting on the throne. Excuse me. Uh, then he said to me, see that you do that. Do not do that. For I am your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. And he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may enter through the gates into the city. Uh, and then it says in verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. So here we go. We the, the, the person speaking didn't change, okay? It's still the same person before. Okay, so in verse 12, we have this person, whoever is speaking, uh, I say person, and I mean, you know, whoever it is, okay? Uh, this, this somebody, this somebody speaking in verse 12. And it says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Whoever is saying that, we just know that that's someone. Okay, we'll just label this person, per, uh, this thing, uh, X, okay? X said this, okay? But then we look down and we see... It's still the same somebody talking. It's still X talking, okay? So down in verse 16, X identifies himself and says, I, 
Jesus have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I'm the root and the offspring of David, a bright and morning star. So that right there proves the divinity, The, the proves that uh, the Son is the Alpha and the Omega and therefore is Yahuwah. Um, unless you were to try to contend that being Alpha and Omega does not make you Yahuwah. But then, uh, if it doesn't, then what does? That's a question to ask. Now, I am going to discuss some of the other things that he mentioned. Uh, his second video talks about uh, uh, the prophet, uh, Mo uh, the, a new prophet like Moses. Um, now let's look uh, at Acts uh, chapter 3, verse, um, verses... Um, verses 22 to 26 okay um for moses said the lord your god will raise up for you a prophet like me for among your own people you must listen to everything he tells you anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people indeed beginning with samuel all the prophets who have spoken have foretold these days and you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant god made with your fathers he said to abraham through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. This passage clearly proves uh, to the contrary of what most Christians believe. It says, ah, oh, sorry, I'm reading from NIV. I don't like reading from NIV. I didn't realize until after I read it. My apologies. But Okay, anyway, we'll deal with what we just read. And um, so basically... Um, that right there, it does. If it, if it was clearly a prophecy of the Messiah, then why didn't they connect it to the Messiah? They didn't. They connected it to prophets. You see, right after they quote it, they say, "Indeed, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets who have spoken have foretold these days." It's saying they're supposed to listen to the prophets that have foretold of these days. So they were told to listen to their prophets. Okay, that's all that that context is indicating. And um, let me go back to Deuteronomy. Uh, chapter 18, where it's quoting from, and we see the Lord, it says, the Lord God, your God, from verse 15, um, um, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst and from your brethren, him you shall hear according to all you desired of the Lord your God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, what they have spoken is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among his, their brethren and will put my mouth in his words and he shall speak to them all that I command him and it shall be that whoever will not hear my words which he speaks in my name I will require it of him but the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name which I have not commanded him to speak or who speaks in the name of other gods that prophet shall die and if you say in your heart how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if a thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. So we just read from, uh, we read from that chapter, and that clearly shows that you can't use any of this to for the Messiah, to describe the Messiah, because it's only talking about a prophet, not the prophet, okay? It's not a messianic prophecy. It's a, when I send you a prophet, a prophet, not the prophet, uh, this is what he will be like. So, uh, this is how he's supposed to be like. But if he's not like this, then you are to reject him. And he's talking about prophets in general, the, the, the uh, ministry of prophecy. That's what it's discussing, okay? So it, it can't be in any way connected to the Messiah. Now, I want to address another thing uh, in another video he did, uh, Zechariah chapter 12, um, verse 10. He claims that this, uh, it's proven it's not talking about the Son because it's in the context of Millennial Kingdom, okay? But this is an uh, absurd objection because he's clearly talking about the past. He's saying, look at me who has been pierced. So 
Yes, the context is when he ret when he when Yahuwah comes for the millennial kingdom to establish it, they will look on him and see the one that they had pierced. It's not saying the one they had pierced just then. It's saying the one they had pierced two thousand years ago. Okay, well, two thousand hundred and something years ago. At any rate, um, so it's clear from this passage. It's very clear that. And I'm pretty sure they connect this passage in the New Testament to the Messiah, but maybe not. Maybe I'm mistaken. But at any rate, um, throughout the entirety of the chapter, it's Yahuwah talking. Yahuwah says the one who they pierced. And they never pierced Yahuwah. They pierced the Son only. So therefore, yes, it's talking about Messianic Kingdom. But it's also, it, as it's talking about the Messianic Kingdom, it's saying, look what you did to me so long ago. That's what it's saying. And when he says you, like for instance, Israel, right? Israel refers, he says, what you have done to me long ago. You know, Israel, it's a, it's, it's a community, it's a collective. They refer to all Israelites as one person. Look what you did to me, Israel. All right? He was married to Israel. He divorced Israel. Uh, those kind of things. All right. So it's clear that he's referring to what the nation did to him in the past. Look at me, Israel, whom you have, you whom you have pierced. So I believe that proves um, the Messiah uh, that the Son is Yahuwah. Then we have um, uh, he talks about Ephesians. He, he, he cites Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8, saying that because the Son, it, it's clear from his analysis, I agree with him, that the Son is receiving gifts from someone else. He's receiving gifts from the Father and giving the gifts to us. Now, he believes that because he's receiving the gifts from the Father, that proves that he is not uh, Yahuwah, but... I agree with him that Trin the Trinity is false, okay? But it's very clear from the rest of scriptures that the Son and the Father are distinguished and they're the same person. Now, I'm going to address this in other videos, uh, in another video. It's, it mainly has to do with, uh, it mainly has to do with time, philosophy of time, okay? Um, so we'll discuss that in another video. But the truth is, yes, there is a distinguishing. That's the point. It's a distinguished... The Son is distinguished from the Father, but they're the same person. And there's no contradiction. It's not too hard to understand. It's not a mystery. Alright? It just needs to be... You just need to be open to the idea. You need to discuss it with an open mind. And I can show you in another video how they're distinguished and yet the same one person. Not three persons. Or two persons. Okay? So, um... And uh, a lot of... I, I would say a lot of his videos are light are like this, they, it cites examples where there's distinguishes, okay, just uh, distinguishing marks. Um, so, for instance, you know, in Acts 17 and Acts 10, he said, Acts 17 verse 31 and Acts 10 38, both of those refer to a distinguished, uh, in 31, a man, anointed a man, apart from Yahuwah, and in 38, it says something similar, uh, let me just check it, it says, uh, God anointed Jesus, okay? I maintain that in both those passages, he's referring to himself. God appointed Jesus, or in other words, God appointed himself, but the, him, his self that was distinguished from him, and that um, he appointed a man. He appointed him, he appointed a man from, from eternity past, okay? He appointed a man, and this man was his own self that he appointed, okay? So that's what I believe. Um, there, there's a lot more videos uh, to discuss, but since I'm close to the 15 minute mark, um, this will be all I, I do for this video. Uh, so stay tuned for part two of going through uh, Prove Your Faith videos. Thank you and Shalom. Shalom, this is Anai who I am uh, making this video on the on kenosis of the Messiah. So I would like to, um, there's, uh, there's some scriptures I'd like to read. Um, 
one of them is uh, Hebrews chapter 2. Okay, so I'm going to read that. Therefore, uh, I'm just going to skip all that part. I'm going to go to verse 5. For he has not put the world to come, of which we speak in subjection to angels, but one testified in a certain place, saying, What is man you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Okay. If we, if we take this verse, it's uh, these verses, it's very clear that the Son existed before he was born. Uh, and by the way, this the video of kenosis, uh, um, whether or not the whether whether or not the Son is uh, Yahuwah or just some you know uh, a created being, um, it's clear that kenosis is has to be true from the other scriptures we read. This ver passage we just read, Hebrews 2, and another passage I'm about to read, clearly teach kenosis. And there's no other way you can interpret it with a uh, sound, honest interpretation. Reading of it, okay? Um, the It says here that the Son of Man was made lower than the angels. How do we know that it's the Son of Man, Jesus? Because in verse 9, it says Jesus was made a little lower than the angels. It's obviously connecting the two together. Um, uh, so that means at one time Jesus was not lower than the angels. So he was at least as high as angels are, if not higher. But we look back to verse 5 and it says, For he has not put the world to come, of which we speak in subjection to angels. So clearly, it's not being put in subjection to uh, um, to angels, but it's being put in subjection. The world to come is being put into subjection to the Son of Man, to Jesus. For it says in verse eight, "You have put all things in subjection under His feet." So, Jesus was a created being that existed before the before He was born, and He was not an angel because it says that He has not put the world to come in subjection to angels, but he has put the world to come in subjection to Jesus, who was made lower than the angels. So that means that before he was born, he was higher than the angels. And uh, Philippians will be now, okay? Philippians chapter 2. Um, okay. Verse, start for the verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which also which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of a cross. Therefore God has highly, also has highly exalted him, and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, and of those on earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, in this passage, we just saw being Jesus Christ was in the form of God before he made himself of no reputation. Uh, so the form of God obviously means something higher than angels. Um, okay, so now, let's see here. Um, so then it says, he took the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men, and made himself of no reputation. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death. So we see that his obedience to the point of death as a man led to the atonement for us, okay? So it's clear that the atonement is intimately and intricately linked to the higher being, a being higher than angels, becoming a man. 
and you know, being obedient to the point of death. That's where the, the atonement comes from, and he made himself an reputation, sponsor, that's kenosis right there. So now we also just think for the atonement, uh, how could angels atone for us? Um, they can't. They're uh, in this passage. It's clear. It's, it's it shows that humans can't atone for each other. Just humans and you know, um, mere human. A mere human cannot atone for another mere human. That's why. Otherwise, Jesus wouldn't have to take the form of a man. We we could just do it ourselves. Okay, so it's clearly that's not the case. And angels. Now it's always the case in with judges, uh, with uh, atonement or forgiveness, uh, pardon. You know, in the courtroom when you pardon someone, it has to be in with the parties, individuals involved. Um, there's the judge, and there's the people who are involved. Uh, the judge can pardon people. The person prosecuting can pardon, but the angels they're not really involved in that process at all, and. I don't see how angels, they're, they're created beings, how do they have the authority to atone? I just don't see it. And even if they could, the scriptures clearly teach that it wasn't Jesus. Jesus was not an angel. He was above an angel. Um, other scriptures clearly show that pretty much angels is the highest thing you can get to. So there's nothing really higher than angels except God himself. So we can pretty much conclude that if Jesus is higher than angels, then he is Yahuwah. Um, unless you can tell me that something that's some kind of type of being that's higher than angels that I'm unaware of. But at any rate, let's, I, the video is mainly supposed to be about kenosis and what that means. So it, it's a being that's higher than angels, uh, lo lowering, limiting itself. So let's, let's uh, just discuss this in the idea of Yahuwah himself, um, lowering himself, and um, so Yahuwah, how he lowers himself is, well, before he lowered himself, what was he like? Well, omnipotent, alright, so we have omnipotence, which means all-powerful, omniscience, which means he has all knowledge, omnipresent, he's everywhere at all times, uh, what are some of the other things? I always like the omnis. Um, let's see here. Um, hmm. There's... There's... Um, hmm. Well, at any rate, there's... Uh, there's this... Um, I'm not, there's other things, too, just about who God is. His nature. Um, but the idea is that in the way that God, Yahuwah, is di is different than created beings, that was how what well, he had to lower himself. He had to become just like a human being. At how, um, in another video, I demonstrated a human is simply what's what makes someone a human is just what they what physical part of, the physical makes someone human, um, and you know if. As I said in the other video, uh, I believe in the souls of an animals. Animals have souls, I believe. So, if you put a soul in a, it, Yahuwah put a soul on a dog, but he could have put that soul, that soul from that dog, he could have put it in a human. It's not like there's human souls, dog souls, you know. He can put the soul wherever he wants, where he feels it'll best be placed, where the best result will happen. He is in control of where our souls reside and end up, in what body they take, in what kind, what creation. Um, so, for humanity, it has nothing to do with the soul that, that runs the machine, so to speak, that controls things. It has to do with the physicality that makes us human. It's our physical body that makes us a human, not our soul. So, um, we have um, limitations of the body, the um, immortality, I mean, not, excuse me, not immortality, mortality, we have 
psychological limits. We don't have this unlimited knowledge. So Yahuwah has to he has to close doors. He has to, he has all this unlimited unlimited knowledge, and he has to basically close those doors so he cannot access that knowledge. See, just imagine the universe, the entire universe. Imagine the entire universe, okay? Right where I am. Imagine everything being the knowledge of Yahuwah. Basically, what he has to do is close everything off so that the knowledge is basically like this. It's very tightly. He doesn't have that much knowledge now because in order to be a human you can't have you can't be able to have all that knowledge it's too it's impossible for a human to have that much knowledge and still be a human because psychologically physically speaking it's it w could not work the it would uh, short circuit and things like that okay um so we have that we have the on the presence he has to lose he has to instead of being everywhere he has to condense and go whoosh, he has to solidify himself into one place and stay there. Um, that because you know, for us, we have a body, and the body is a limitation. We are physically limited to only one area. We're not able to be at all places everywhere. We're limited in that respect. Uh, that's what makes us human, and he so he would have to do that. And also omnipotence. Uh, we can only have the capabilities of a regular human being. We. You know, it's all about based on the science of our regular bodies, uh, DNA, genetics. You know, so uh, we can't do anything more than what humans are able to do scientifically. So, in that sense, kenosis is all about divine versus the human, and how divine can be human. So the divine's way over here, and humans over here, and Kenosis is all about the divine coming together with humanity, but the only way it can do that, humanity cannot, the, humanity cannot go and become divinity, okay? Humanity will always stay where it is at the same level, but divinity can lower itself, okay? Divinity, since it has that ability, it has all that stuff, it can temporarily or permanently, whichever chooses, shut it off so that he can become truly a human because in all ways he was human. There was no distinction between anyone else. The only distinction is the soul. His soul is different than other souls, but that's the, the case with everybody. Everybody's soul is different. So his soul was different than all the other souls, but his, his humanity was the same as our humanity. Okay? So, uh, that's what kenosis is, and so I, I just, uh, that's about it for today, the video. I hope you appreciated that, and it's kind of, when you start talking about all these things, it comes in full circle. It's a very, it, it's very, very much in the same discussion and topics, but, um, so that's it for today, and I, uh, hope you enjoyed that video. Thank you, and chill.